Good evening. Appreciate you all, uh, all of you for joining us uh, this evening. My name's Sam Langholz. I'm the president of the Iowa Lawyers Chapter of the Federalist Society. Uh, in my day job, I'm the uh, state public defender of Iowa. And it's my honor to uh, introduce um, our moderator and uh, two panelists uh, today. And we have a, a distinguished group uh, to discuss a topic that's near and dear to my heart. I wrote my law review note um, on voter identification uh, several years ago um, and excited about the, uh, the discussion we'll be having uh, today. Uh, Serving as moderator uh, is Justice Ed Mansfield of the Iowa Supreme Court. Justice Mansfield was appointed by Governor Branstead last year uh, to serve on the Iowa Supreme Court. Previously, um, he served on the Court of Appeals uh, since 2009, and before that, he worked at the Bellin Law Firm here in Des Moines uh, before uh, previously uh, practicing law in, in Arizona. Uh, Justice Mansfield graduated from Harvard Law School Harvard College and Yale Law School uh, and uh, clerked on the United States Court of Appeals for the Fifth Circuit and we're delighted uh, to have him moderating this evening. Uh, we also um, have uh, joining us from uh, Washington DC area uh, Hans von Spakowski uh, who is currently working at the Heritage Foundation Center for Legal and Judicial Studies. Um, he's previously uh, served as a commissioner of the Federal Election Commission um, and also has worked at the Department of Justice in a variety of roles uh, and uh, is an expert in, in election law. We also have joining us uh, from here in Des Moines, uh, Ben Stone, who's the executive director of the American Civil Liberties Union of, I of Iowa. Uh, and he uh, is a graduate of the Drake University Law School and really is a, a distinguished expert in uh, civil liberties of, of all sorts, including the, the right to vote. So we're uh, delighted to have our, our two panelists. And I will, uh, at this time, turn it over to the moderator, uh, Justice Mansfield. So please give me, uh, join me in giving a warm welcome uh, to Justice Mansfield and the panel. Uh, thank you. I was uh, in the process of getting ready for this uh, uh, presentation this afternoon, and I came upon Mr. Langholz's note, and I was going to print it out, but unfortunately, the budget constraints in the <laughs> judicial uh, branch do not allow it. It's 86 pages long, so uh, that that's quite an undertaking. I did uh, look over it, and it's a, it's a very impressive piece of scholarship. Um, I'm going to uh, ask each of the uh, panelists to make some opening remarks and uh, with the hope that maybe in the course of their opening remarks they could uh, set the stage a little bit by talking about the U.S. Supreme Court's Crawford decision and kind of the parameters that that sets in the area of uh, voter uh, identification legislation. So uh, first I think Mr. Spakovsky is, uh, is going to speak. Well, I want to thank the uh, Federalist Society here for the invitation, although, uh, Samuel, if you, if you did an 86-page uh, paper on this, I think maybe you should be up here uh, t talking about this. Um, uh, look, one of the key principles in any fair election, and that's what we want in this country, uh, is ensuring that the people who cast a ballot uh, are legally eligible to do so. And the way to ensure that is to make sure, is to have them authenticate their identity uh, when they vote and also to authenticate their citizenship when they register to vote. Uh, Lincoln Chafee, who is the independent governor of Rhode Island when he signed Rhode Island's voter ID law, which, by the way, was passed by a Democratic legislature, uh, he said that requiring ID at the polling place is a reasonable request to ensure the accuracy and integrity of our elections. Uh, I agree with that. Uh, the Supreme Court agreed with that. In the Crawford versus Marion dis uh, County decision, which was just a couple of years ago, they upheld Indiana's photo ID law, which uh, they consider to be the uh, strictest photo ID law in the country. And to the great consternation of some of the liberal groups that uh, filed amicus briefs in that case, it was not a 5-4 decision, as you would expect. It was a 6-3 decision. And in fact, the leading decision was uh, written by Justice John Paul Stevens, as you know, one of the liberal stalwarts of the court. Um, uh, Justices Roberts, uh, Alito, Thomas, Scalia, Kennedy all joined in the opinion, although there was a special concurrence written by Justice Scalia. And 
I, you know, I, it was, like I said, it was a great surprise to people that Justice Stevens had uh, joined the opinion, but it's actually really not a surprise because the claims that were being made in the case that there's really no such thing as voter fraud in the United States really didn't go over very well with uh, a justice who uh, professionally started as a lawyer in Chicago. <laughs> now, one of the things that the justice said in that case was that examples of such fraud have been documented throughout this nation's history by respected historians and journalists and not only is the risk of voter fraud real, but it could affect the outcome of a close election. And that is certainly the key to why this is needed. Now, opponents of this will say to you two things. First, they'll say, well, the only thing this will prevent is impersonation fraud, and that never happens. And the second thing they'll say to you is that this is intended to suppress the vote, particularly intended to suppress the vote of uh, minorities, African Americans, the poor, and the elderly. Um, the problem is that both of those assertions are wrong. First of all, uh, voter fraud not only can prevent impersonation fraud, and look, I can give you examples of those kind of cases. If you want a very recent one, you can pull a federal district court decision from Mississippi, 2007, a prosecution by the U.S. Department of Justice in Noxabee County, Mississippi. And there's a footnote uh, in that decision. By the way, they found the defendants guilty of uh, violations of the Voting Rights Act, uh, engaging in voter fraud. And there's a footnote in which uh, the judge notes that uh, one of the witnesses in the case, a former deputy sheriff, testified that he saw the defendant in the case outside a polling place telling a young African-American woman that she should go into the polling place and vote, use any name, because nobody's going to catch you. And that's maybe one of the reasons why Mississippi in November, by a referendum, over 62% of the voters voted in favor of amending their state constitution and putting in a voter ID requirement. But voter ID also can prevent uh, voting under fictitious voter registration forms. Uh, it can prevent double voting by people vo uh, who've become registered in uh, more than one state. And it can prevent voting by illegal aliens. Also, uh, cases of that have been uh, found and prosecuted. Now, the idea that it will suppress the vote uh, has been disproven in two very important places, in the courtroom and in the polling place. Georgia and Indiana both passed photo ID laws in 2005. There were immediately federal lawsuits filed in both cases. In fact, uh, the ACLU was a leading plaintiff in the Georgia case. And after two years of, of litigation, and by the way, the claims were unconstitutional in the Georgia case that it violated the Voting Rights Act and was discriminatory because of the very large African American population in the state of Georgia. Um, both cases were eventually dismissed by the, the judges. And why were they dismissed? Well, there was an eerily similar uh, paragraph in each of the two decisions, you know, one in Indiana, one in Georgia. And in the uh, Georgia case, the court made a note of saying, and I, I, don't, I said I don't want to give you a long quote, but this is worth hearing. Although the plaintiffs claim to know of people who claim that they lack photo ID, plaintiffs have failed to identify those individuals. The failure to identify those individuals is particularly acute in light of plaintiffs' contention that a large number of Georgia voters lack acceptable photo ID. The fact that plaintiffs, in spite of their efforts, have failed to uncover anyone who can attest to the fact that he or she will be prevented from voting provides significant support for conclusion that the photo ID requirement does not unduly burden the right to vote. After two years, they couldn't come up with a single witness, not one person, who would be unable to vote because of the photo ID law. And that included, by the way, the plaintiff organization, the NAACP, which couldn't even come up with a single one of its members who would be unable to vote because of the law. Same thing happened in Indiana. And in the Indiana case, uh, the judge said, despite apocalyptic assertions of wholesale voter disenfranchisement, plaintiffs have produced not a single piece of evidence of any identifiable registered voter who would be prevented from voting pursuant to the voter ID law because of his or her inability to obtain the necessary photo ID. Both those laws went into effect 
and they were in effect in 2008 in the presidential race, they were in effect in 2010 in the congressional race, and they were in effect for numerous state and local elections since that time. And in those five and, five and six years now, uh, the, the predicted effect that it would suppress the vote, particularly suppress the vote of Democrats, suppress the vote of minorities, that has not happened. In fact, if you look at turnout in the 2008 election, uh, most of you know turnout was generally up across the country. We had one of the highest turnouts in decades uh, in the election where you know, Barack Obama was running against John McCain. And Georgia had a record turnout. In fact, they had more people turn out for the election than they'd ever had in their entire history. Uh, the turnout of uh, Democratic voters went up 6.1 percentage points. And this is according to figures released by American University in uh, Washington, D.C. That was the fifth largest increase in turnout of any state in the United States. And that includes states that don't have photo ID. Uh, the overall turnout in the state was up 6.7 percentage points. That was the second largest in the country. The black share of the vote went from 25% to 30%. There was a 10% point increase in black voting age population from the 2004 election when there was no photo ID law in effect. Um, uh, I've heard people say to me in debates, well, that's because Barack Obama was on the ballot. Sorry, if you look at the 2010 election when he wasn't on the ballot, Georgia had a 7 percentage point increase in the turnout of registered black Georgians over 2006, the last time there was a midterm congressional election when there was no photo ID law in place. Uh, the same thing happened in Indiana. In Indiana, the turnout of Democratic voters uh, went up eight percentage points over 2004 when there was no photo ID law in effect. And in the 2010 congressional elections, they actually had a larger number of black citizens turn out to vote in Indiana than they'd had in 2008. Now, you will also hear uh, uh, opponents of this say, well, this is a Republican plot to try to keep people from voting. Well, clearly, if it is, it's not a very good one because the turnout figures in these states show that that's not the case. Um, it's true that a lot of these laws have been passed in um, states with Republican legislatures. I, frankly, I think that's a sad comment on uh, those Democratic uh, legislators that have opposed it and basically are tolerating voter fraud. But the thing about that is, is they're not listening to their constituents. If you look at the polling data on this, you'll find that uh, the, one of the last polls I saw was a Rasmussen poll. Voters across the board, doesn't matter what their race, what their ethnicity is, they overwhelmingly support voter ID and think it is a good idea. Um, Arthur Davis is a former congressman from Alabama, served, I think, at least three terms in the, in the state. Uh, former member of the Congressional Black Caucus. And he wrote quite a startling uh, commentary about three months ago in a Montgomery paper. He said, quote, I've changed my mind on voter ID laws. I think Alabama did the right thing in passing one, and I wish I had gotten it right when I was in political office. When I was a congressman, I took the path of least resistance on this subject for an African-American politician. Without any evidence to back it up, I lapsed into the rhetoric of various partisans and activists. The truth is that the most aggressive contemporary voter suppression in the African American community, at least in Alabama, is the wholesale manufacture of ballots at the polls in absentee in parts, uh, at the polls and absentee in parts of the state. If you doubt it exists, I don't. I've heard the peddlers of these ballots brag about it. I've been asked to provide the funds for it, and I'm confident it has changed at least a few close election results. Now, why do Americans support this, and why is it that in the states that have put this in, none of the effects that the ACLU, the Brennan Center, uh, have been predicting for years have happened? Well, it's because most Americans realize that, first of all, every state that's passed this has put in a free photo ID 
for anybody who can't afford it. Second, the number of people who have photo IDs is overwhelming. The percentage of individuals who don't have one is extremely small. That's what all the surveys that have been done of registered voters show, including the latest check in South Carolina where the Justice Department, really with no factual or legal basis, objected to South Carolina's law. Um, you have to have a photo ID if you want to cash a check, buy a beer, board an airplane, get on Amtrak, which I do a lot in, the, uh, in, in Washington when I'm headed to the Northeast. Uh, you want to get a prescription at a pharmacy if you're an elderly uh, American, you better have a photo ID. You have to have a photo ID when you go to the doctor the first time. They all ask for that. Uh, that's why people support it. And uh, another two points about this. Um, under federal law, federal immigration law, as most of you know, if you're an employer, you have to fill out a form. It's called the I-9 form on anybody that you're hiring as a prospective employee. So if you're an American and you want to get a job, which to me is a pretty fundamental right to earn a living and support my family, uh, you have to meet the requirements of the I-9 form. And what does the I-9 form require you to do? It requires you to authenticate your citizenship and your identity. And what are the states doing? They're doing almost the same thing that the federal government is requiring. I, I'm not quite sure why. If the states are doing it, it's Jim Crow. If the federal government is doing it, it isn't. Now, I've heard people say to me, well, that's not a fundamental constitutional right. Sorry, my 10 minute, with my oh, eight, OK, I'm almost done. Um, they'll say to me, well, that's not a fundamental constitutional right. I, I would probably disagree with that. But I'll tell you what is a fundamental constitutional right. Uh, you know, we all know the First Amendment has many different uh, parts of it. But one of the parts of the First Amendment is, is the right to petition the government for redress of grievances. Well, what is that? that that's, that's the old term for lobbying, right? OK, well, if you want to go speak to Eric Holder at the Justice Department and complain to him about the fact that he has objected to South Carolina's photo ID law because he says it's discriminatory, you better bring your government-issued photo ID because you can't get into the Justice Department building without a photo ID. In fact, you have to show it twice. I know that because I used to work there. They have two guards that stand outside the main entrance on Constitution Avenue. You can't even get by the guards to get into the building without a government-issued uh, photo ID. We are the only Western democracy that doesn't uniformly require photo ID when people vote. Uh, Mexico put in a requirement like this in the 1990s. Mexico had been plagued by voter fraud for many years. They put in a photo ID requirement. Uh, they even went as far as you, you not only have a photo ID if you want to if you want to vote, you have to they, they actually require a thumbprint on your photo ID. A lot of people credit that the implementation of that requirement for the fact that something happened in the 1990s that hadn't happened uh, in 60 years, which was the head of the opposition party was elected president. Uh, I don't think it's too much to ask uh, people to show a photo ID. The American people don't think it's too much uh, to do that. Uh, the evidence is very clear in the courtroom and in the polling place that photo ID is not a burden for voters. It's one they can easily meet. And uh, I would end with what uh, Rhode Island Democratic State Representative John Bryan said, who was one of the chief sponsors of the law in Rhode Island. He said, voting is one of the most important rights and duties we have as Americans, and it should be treated accordingly. Thanks. All right, now we'll hear Mr. Stone's perspective. Uh, I want to thank the Federalists for inviting me. This is my second gig in the last couple of months. I'm becoming a regular, so that's quite exciting. It's good to contribute to the marketplace of ideas, uh, since that's something we can care about a great deal. Um, I want to start off by just asking everybody in the room to think about their favorite politician. Just think for a moment. Who is your favorite current serving politician? Secretary Schultz, I, I'm sure that you 
have some people in mind. Um, uh, okay, now imagine whether or not you would be willing to risk a five-year prison sentence to give that favorite politician one more vote. Because that's what you're risking if you impersonate someone else to vote. Now it's clear, as been pointed out by, by Hans, that uh, you know things happen. Ignorant people do things they're taken advantage of. Um, but the idea that uh, it is widespread, that kind of fraud, where people impersonate somebody, is extremely, extremely rare. And I think that it's something that we should keep in mind as we start talking about this issue, at least as I bring my perspective in. Um, if you look at the history of this country, and really the history of the world, uh, there really has been a trajectory of people attempting to gain the ability to influence their own lives through voting. You know, at the, at the founding in 1787, you know, the, the Constitution of the United States was ratified by white men who had property. By the Civil War, it got to the point where most white men, even those without property, were able to vote. And then, of course, with the Civil War, in the Civil War amendments, some things changed. Uh, you couldn't be denied the right to vote for the you know, previous condition of servitude, race, uh, ethnicity. And then uh, 20th century rolls around, and finally with the 19th Amendment, uh, women get the right to vote in 1920. Well, between 1920 and 19, the 1960s, there was uh, a period of you know, horrific lynching in the South. The Democratic Party in the South uh, acted ruthlessly to keep uh, African Americans from participating in the electoral process and voting. And finally, in 1965, with the Voting Rights Act, uh, we saw poll taxes, literacy tests, um, eliminated with federal legislation and enforcement, which we still see today with obviously the condition of things in, in South Carolina, that, that that act is still in, in force and being used. In 1966, with the Harper decision, the Supreme Court ruled that uh, state elections couldn't have poll taxes. And, um, and Harper, of course, is cited in the, in the Marion County decision. And then finally, in 1971, the kids, the 18-year-olds, they got to vote. Before that, it was 21-year-old people. So there's this, this, this long period of history of people gaining more access. You know, in the old days, it was just those white property males and it's gotten broader over the years. Um, but you know what, in, in 19, in, in, excuse, me, excuse me, 2008, um, the statistics that, uh, that Hans br brings up, uh, I, I really think that they're instructive because the massive turnout uh, in the 2008 election uh, of young people uh, really uh, was a central part, I, I understand, I'm not a political scientist, of. Uh, the success of the Democratic Party and uh, specifically of Barack Obama. Well, in the aftermath of that election, uh, there was a meeting of the uh, American Legislative Exchange Council. You know them as ALEC. Uh, this is the group that's largely founded and uh, in many ways funded by the, uh, the Koch brothers. Uh, well, they met after the 2008 elections and one of their priorities in that, uh, in that time period was uh, the creation of model legislation on voter ID. And I think it's just instructive to, to think about what that particular reality means. That uh, this became a priority of an organization who has a long and successful track record of promoting a very specific agenda that doesn't often include uh, the interest of, of you know, very poor people, people that are typically disenfranchised. So um, that's something to keep in mind. Now, to get specifically on much of the material that uh, Mr. Von Sprosky talked about, uh, those uh, results from Georgia and Indiana, um, I gotta tell you, I've spent uh, a good part of the last seven or eight years talking about traffic cameras, which we might have a very friendly audience here. Um, it's definitely more of a Republican issue of the ones that we do. Um, and it's interesting, you know, there's always statistics about you know, well, once the traffic camera's up, look what happens. The statistics, you know, the, the accidents go down and you know, all this stuff. 
And you know, this is really basic logic 101. Uh, there are so many factors that go into what kind of accidents occur at an intersection, and there's so many factors that go into what happens that makes people vote. Unless you can isolate all the other factors, statistics don't mean a thing. I mean, you can't really make a statement either direction, of any kind of quantity at least. I mean, the fact that a bunch of people voted in 2008 and 2010 in those states uh, can be attributed to any number of, of causes. You know, the, uh, the situation politically in terms of the motivation of people to vote, the uh, polling places, how many polling places were there? Were there more staffing? Did they do a better job of absentee balloting? I mean, there's just tons and tons of factors that go into that. And frankly, the statistics that, that Hans is citing, they don't mean a thing. They mean nothing. You can't say that those statistics prove anything. They don't prove anything in the affirmative. They don't prove anything in the negative. But I'll tell you this much. I think that if you use your, your ability to think intuitively and logically, you will understand that uh, requiring voter ID does indeed suppress. Um, I think it's, it's counterintuitive and frankly just disingenuous to say it doesn't suppress. The question is, with that suppression, is it justified by the benefit of the suppression? There's a little suppression by this. I can tell you firsthand because my father is in a nursing home. He fell about four and a half years ago and he has not driven a car since. He does not have his current ID. And these type of ID laws would make people like my father uh, have to go out and find their way to the motor vehicles and you know, things like that. And a lot of people, they have to find their old birth certificate if, they're, if it's expired. I mean, there's all kinds of things. Uh, and frankly, many people in nursing homes have much more important things on their mind, like surviving their illnesses and their, their horrible, getting old is really hard. <laughs> It's, it's hard to watch my dad, but um, it's, you know, he's got more important things to worry about than find a way to get over to the motor vehicle thing, which is clear on the other side of the county. So it does, it does have the effect of suppressing, because if you put things, if you say, look, okay, you can vote now, but if you want to vote next time, you've got to do this, this, and this. Of course it's going to keep some people from voting. The question is, is it justified? Is there a body of evidence that shows that it needs to be done? And I'll take a moment to talk about the the Marion County decision. I really think, uh, Justice Mansfield, that um, there is a chance that the, uh, the Wisconsin case could be won. There's, the ACLU fought a lawsuit in Wisconsin in December challenging the uh, voter ID law there. Um, ACLU has found 17 plaintiffs. Uh, obviously, the lack of concrete examples uh, was not helpful in previous litigations, as, uh, as Hans has pointed out. They have 17 plaintiffs and they brought a case, and I really think that there is a chance that you have the, the three, um, you know, the three justices, uh, um, I better get out my notes here so I can not talk inaccurately, but, uh, you know, you had Souter, Breyer, and Ginsburg dissenting, and you had, uh, um, Stevens, Roberts, Stevens, Roberts Kennedy. and Kennedy, and, 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 and Stevens wrote the opinion, so there was three and three, there was a concurrence, and uh, the three that were, in the, that were with Stevens, those three, they found that there simply, there really wasn't enough evidence to justify a facial challenge or a facial strike down of the, of the, of the statute. The other three, who were um, Roberts Kennedy and Alito, Alito, Alito Scalia and Thomas, yeah. Um, they felt that uh, there was a uh, important regulatory interest test that would be much lower and basically said if there is a differential impact of a non-severe, non-discriminatory uh, law that even if it had a differential impact on certain groups of people, like homeless, like elderly, uh, they thought that was not uh, sufficient to justify overturning the statute. So they're clearly not, not there, but I think with the, uh, uh, with Souter being replaced, 
I don't, can't, I don't know which one replaced whom. I can't remember, but Souter and and, uh, uh, and Stevens have been replaced by uh, Sotomayor and uh, and is it Kagan? And so that makes it different. I think there's a chance that because you're going to have the three, uh, we assume that Sotomayor uh, will be with the uh, the three dissenters earlier. Uh, it's going to be a matter of whether or not uh, Roberts or Kennedy are convinced that. Uh, a better showing of evidence could make a as applied challenge successful. Uh, frankly, the odds are probably pretty long, but uh, we're going to give it a shot. So, with that, let me uh, let me wrap up here. I don't want to overgo my time. Um, a few things that I'll that I will mention here. Um, you know, one of the reasons why um, these are so popular, I think. Uh, is first of all, you know, it does work. You know, you got to show your ID for a lot of things. But really what this, what the ACLU alleges and others allege is that there is uh, polling data, survey data that's done in a scientific way by reputable firms that demonstrates that uh, as many as 21 million Americans do not have uh, current valid uh, government IDs that uh, fully uh, up to 25% of, of African Americans could lack these. Uh, one in five people in the elderly category are like my father. Uh, they've gotten sick, they don't drive anymore, they don't get out. Um, and so the people that this affects, and, and, and poor people, homeless people, people that do not, that make less than 20, if you make less than 25,000 a year, you are more than twice as likely to not have an ID than if you uh, are someone that makes more than that, or in a household that makes more than that. So I think that what we have to keep in mind is that um, when you think about the world that people watch every day when they turn on their television sets, they don't see old people in nursing homes and they don't see poor people. They don't, they're invisible. And so the world that people are thinking of is, well, everybody that I think of has an ID and the people that Frankly, I would imagine that everybody in this room has an ID. But this isn't a demographic of the entire body politic. There are people about 10 blocks that way that don't have IDs, and they have a constitutional right to vote. And uh, the kind of fraud that is a problem, and we can get into more of that, the, 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 the kind of things where government officials are involved in creating that kind of Chicago style. You know, Richard Daley, the, you know, helping uh, John F. Kennedy get elected, apparently. I'm not a big student of that, but that's sort of apparently history has shown. Um, that people really do, um, you know, they have a right to vote. And we shouldn't be using voter ID when we have other avenues. You have better databases. I mean, the, the, you know, people going in and voting uh, voting for, with uh, dead people's names. Well, if you remove the dead people's names, it's not a problem. And there was an article um, a couple weeks ago, I think it was, Hans, that, that talks about, it was a Pew study about the, all the troubles in the databases in this country. You know, and it is hard, you know, if you move from one state to another and you know, somebody dies, or you, you know, when you move from one state to another, is the first thing you think of, oh, I better call the people in the old state and tell them I'm no longer living there. You know, nobody does that. So there's ways that databases can be made to fix a lot of these problems, and it wouldn't put a burden uh, on people who are simply wanting to exercise the right to vote. And uh, you know, we can quibble over, this, over the number of people that this would affect, but I really think it's, it's really impossible to say it won't affect a few. Uh, and depending upon the nature of the exceptions, uh, Secretary of State Schultz bill that uh, you talked about at your press conference, um, uh, certainly has addressed some of those concerns. It's got more exceptions. Um, and of course, the Supreme Court does require that you can't, re you can't have a poll tax, and requiring a fee for an ID would be a poll tax. So all seven states that currently have uh, voter uh, photo ID, government-issued photo ID, um, do, require, do not require that you pay for them if you can get a waiver for your uh, indigency. So um, with that, I think I will be uh, happy to sit down and we can take questions. Thank you.
Let me, let me exercise the, the moderator's uh, prerogative and ask one question of each of them. Um, uh, first, Mr. Uh, Spakovsky, let me ask you one question. Um, one, it, one argument that's often raised is to the extent there is a problem uh, in the area uh, that the photo ID laws don't necessarily attack the real problem because they don't get at absentee voting, early voting, where some people believe that the real potential for fraud exists. So um, I'd be well, interested in your views on that. Well, look, I've heard that argument, but that's like saying, oh, well, if you only take one security measure and it doesn't uh, um, fix every single problem, well, then you shouldn't do it. And anybody who does anything with regard to security, whether it's building security or internet security, whatever, knows that you have to take a whole series of steps to have security. And none of it is perfect. People can always get around it. And uh, with regard to absentee ballots, well, you're right about that. I mean, absentee ballots are a big tool of choice for people who want to steal elections. And uh, the way you can fix that problem and deter that is if you do what Kansas did. And by the way, the Kansas, uh, the Kansas voter ID bill, which was uh, proposed by the Republican Secretary of State, uh, in the final vote, uh, a majority of Democrats in the House and Senate approved it. And one of the things they put in there, besides a photo ID law and a proof of citizenship requirement, was a new requirement for absentee ballots that said that when you request an absentee ballot, most of you know you fill out a form has your name and address on it. Well, I can send in 100 absentee ballot requests for 100 people on the voter registration form because you could get that information who's registered very easily. So what Kansas did is they put in a provision that says that you also have to either send with the absentee ballot request a photocopy of your government issued photo ID, or if you have a driver's license from the state, which 99% of voters do, you put, on, you put the driver's license number on there. And that, is that a, a complete cure? No. But it is a way of preventing the kind of absentee ballot fraud that does occur. And right now, today, there's a trial going on in Troy, New York. It's been going on for three weeks. Massive absentee ballot fraud in the election there. They've already convicted four people for doing that. And two more uh, individuals, the town clerk and a city councilman, are on trial for that. Uh, Mr. Stone, let me ask you a question. Uh, to the extent um, that you know, the goal is to eliminate all barriers to voting, is that a, is that a goal that's really attainable? Um, I, if you're poor, you're always going to have more difficulty getting mm -hmm. the polls than if you're not poor. Um, even looking at current Iowa law, um, as I read it, it does say a precinct election official may require of the voter unknown to the official identification upon mm -hmm. which the voter's signature or mark appears. Right. And I can recall mm -hmm. instances where I've been asked to produce ID when I go to the polls. It's mm -hmm. kind of a hit or miss kind of thing. Um, so given that, that barrier-free voting mm -hmm. is, is, is never going to be a, a attainable, what's mm -hmm. wrong with, with a, an ID requirement? Well, I think what's good about the current ID requirement in Iowa is that it allows for someone to show up. Uh, a utility bill uh, is something they can, they can show. Um, so that aspect of it, I think, is, is reasonable. And, you know, in regard to the, um, the photocopy of an absentee ballot, um, you know, that's not as problematic because if you can still go to the poll, if you require an ID both places, then it becomes more of a barrier. But I think that... Uh, that is a, a response that uh, that seems more reasonable uh, at first glance. So, do we have questions from the audience? All right, Mr. Brown. They're, they're recording this, so they want to be sure that you you get heard. So you won't be able to deny this later. <laughs> Make sure I'm not being blocked. <laughs> okay, is it working? Uh, one thing that I think 
has been interesting about this whole debate about voter identification is an issue that I don't think has been aired about this issue. And that is, you know, we have a, a society right now that is very skeptical of government, really on both sides of the spectrum. It doesn't matter whether you're Democrat or Republican, there's plenty of people that just don't trust government for one reason or another. And my question is this, wouldn't providing a voter ID give the populace more confidence that the people who are elected are in fact the ones that should have been elected based on the popular vote so that the voter identification is really a citizen confidence issue as, more than anything else, that they believe that their government is in fact the elected government because it's invariably impossible to determine how much voter fraud occurs because you can't catch it all. <laughs> so, you know, by putting those measures in, putting confidence in government, seems to me like it would be uh, improved dramatically. So yeah, why I, hasn't that been part of the debate? What, what it has, and in mm -hmm. fact, if you, read, if you read the Supreme Court's decision in, in Marion County, in the mm -hmm. Indiana case, in fact, Justice Stevens talks about that very fact, mm -hmm. that this helps improve public confidence in elections. And I, I, I do think that's an important factor. And, and I'll give you another very specific example of this that it, it doesn't so much involve voter ID, but it involves this very issue. I, I did a case study for the Heritage Foundation, I wrote a paper about it if anybody wants to hit on the website, of a voter prosecution in Greene County, Alabama in the mid-1990s. So this, this was done during the Clinton administration. Um, Green County is one of the poorest counties in the state of Alabama. It's probably one of the poorest rural counties in, in the United States. In fact, I think they were one of the first counties to file for bankruptcy. But anyway, they prosecuted this voter fraud case there. This is a overwhelmingly African-American county. Um, the people who were prosecuted and successfully convicted by the Justice Department were 11 local uh, African-American city councilmen, commissioners. The people they were stealing votes from were challengers, African-American challengers, from within their own uh, party. This is a, a democratic county, and the government was very corrupt locally, and the challengers were running on a reform ticket. And their, their, their uh, ballots were clearly stolen. Um, the NAACP did everything it could to try to get this prosecution ended. Julian Bond, who was the head of the NAACP at the time, said, oh, you're, this prosecution, you're trying to suppress uh, the vote of black citizens there. Fortunately, the Justice Department uh, saw this case through, prosecuted, successfully convicted these individuals. And what happened after these people went to jail? Turnout in the county went up. And, and uh, one of the FBI agents that I interviewed on this told me that he had gotten a call after the case was over from um, an, an elderly African-American woman who he had talked to when he was investigating it. And she thanked him for this prosecution and said that she had gone and voted in the last election because she finally felt like her vote would count. Because everybody in the county before this knew what was going on because it had been going on for years. And that's a graphic example of how important it is for people to have confidence in the system. The best kind of election system is one in which after election day, the loser says, you know, I lost the election, but it was a fair election, and everybody thinks that uh, what happened was correct, and they don't contest it. And that's the kind of election system we want. And I'm happy to report that here in Iowa, that's the kind of elections we always have. There's a, a study from the county auditors, you know, after Secretary of State Schultz was elected, they, um, they got a group together of auditors, and they went to Indiana and Florida, and they issued a report, and I'm sure you're all familiar with it, uh, they opposed the bill last year. Uh, don't even taken a position on the proposal. You haven't filed it yet, but I know that they're looking at it. Well, those those uh, county auditors. Um, at one point, there's there's uh, you know three of them that have 58 combined years of experience running county elections, and those 58 combined years from those three county auditors, they could not cite one single case of fraud. You know, I was got a lot of rural communities. So, I mean, that's certainly something to keep in mind. But I think that, you know, obviously confidence means a lot, Mr. Brown. I mean, that's, that's, that's a big part of this. But I think what we have to wonder is, you know, for instance, that really horrible situation that 
that Hans described. I mean, that kind of corruption that where you get some machine, you know, from like Tammany Hall all the way to modern times, where the election system is just a farce, you know. The question is, how do you address it? What is the way that you fix that? And I just think that there's a lot of evidence that there's a lot of other ways to deal with it other than voter ID. And a lot of it, I think there's a lot of promise that databases are getting more sophisticated. They'll have cross-referencing with uh, all across the state and between states where you can actually find ways to get, pe get people eliminated who, are, who have passed away, people who are legitimately felons and should not be on the voting rolls. Uh, so I think there's a lot of possibilities out there. And I think what the ACLU and others uh, who agree with us believe is that we want our legislatures to you know, be cautious. Don't go with anecdotal you know, stories that are you know, compelling and interesting, but really look for hard data. Look for something that you can really rely on as a legislator. Uh, and there simply is just no evidence of, of the kind of fraud that would be uh, significantly helped by voter ID in Iowa. Are, are you telling us you'd support a national database? Well, you know, the, the, the national ID, we, we never, we'll never go there, uh, Justice Mansfield. But the simple fact is that there are databases that communicate uh, for purposes of voting, and they, they're necessary. Uh, but no, we don't like national ID, and it, you know, it still isn't here. There were people predicting 10 years ago, though, we'll have a national ID in just a few years. And thankfully, that's one of those issues that cuts across ideological lines. Mr. Eaton? A uh, question to any or all of the uh, panel <clears throat> regarding uh, hard data. Uh, is there evidence that photo ID requirements cause otherwise qualified voters not to vote? No. No, there, there isn't. Now, uh, you know, Ben said, well, I brought up all these statistics. They don't really mean anything. I didn't bring up statistics. Statistics came up because in 2000, look, this claim that there's these huge numbers of people without photo ID, this all traces back to one study. One study done by the Brennan Center in 2006. It was sponsored by the Brennan Center. The Brennan Center did this study, 2006. Uh, the Brennan Center is not a nonpartisan objective group. They're an advocacy organization. They've been fighting photo ID for years. And what was their, their study that everybody's relying on to say that they're, you know, 25 million people have photo ID. A survey of, that they did of 987 people, uh, not even making a determination whether they're actually eligible voters, uh, not people who are registered voters. I, I actually wrote, I've written this long paper, I'm not, not gonna go into the details, that's published at Heritage that points out all the statistical flaws in the study they did. There are numerous other surveys that have been done where they actually went and talked, for example, to registered voters. American University did one. They went and they, they checked with registered voters in Maryland, Indiana, Mississippi. And what did they find? They found that less than one half of 1% of registered voters didn't have either a photo ID already or proof that they're citizens. And another great example of this is in South Carolina, where the Justice Department just objected. South Carolina took its voter registration list, 2.7 million registered voters, and they checked it against their current DMV list. The numbers they put out initially, they had to adjust because it turned out that they had not taken into account the fact that apparently there were tens of thousands of people who were dead who were still on the voter registration list. And there were tens of thousands of people who had moved out of state but were still on the voter registration list. Once they adjusted those numbers with this brand new law that hasn't even really gone into place yet and before they've even started issuing free photo IDs, anybody doesn't have one, uh, the number of registered voters who don't already have a driver's license was 1.2%, a tiny percentage. And people who can easily be taken care of uh, by the free photo ID provision. Well, I, I think I'd have to dispute that it would be easy because some people have a very difficult time obtaining the underlying documents. Uh, there can be expenses for that and it can be difficult to find a birth certificate if you're an elderly person. Um, among the 17 people that have been identified in the lawsuit that the ACU brought in Wisconsin, uh, there are several examples of the difficulty 
of finding it. Now, the hard numbers, I mean, you can speculate all you want. I know that there's also criticisms of information and statistics that, that the Heritage Foundation has brought forth as well. So you can always do that, and if we want to have an actuarial battle, we can have another meeting another, another day and bring in some people that know well, that well, I Well, no one has disputed you know. the turnout figures mm -hmm. that I have put out from Georgia and Indiana. Those were easily ob obtained by looking at re re yeah, reports on that. And mm -hmm. actually, I would suggest you all pull the ACLU suit from Wisconsin because I actually was laughing when I was reading it. Why? Because they have half a dozen plaintiffs who, you know what their complaint is about the Wisconsin photo ID law? It's not that they don't have a photo ID. Oh, they've got one from another state. They have driver's licenses in other states, yet they're claiming to be residents of Wisconsin, and this, this terrible law will force them to give up their driver's licenses in these other states. <laughs> I mean, that is, that is, not, that is a non-serious claim. Yes. Come yeah. up. You mentioned that the uh, number of, uh, in your study, less than one half of one percent. That was not my study, it was American University. Well, theirs right. didn't have a photo ID. Well, out of a million people, wouldn't that be 10,000 voters? The state has a free photo ID. They can well, easily get one. But I mean, that'd be 10,000 voters we should be concerned about, shouldn't we? Uh, not, the ACLU was unable to bring forward a single individual who couldn't easily go get a photo ID, and that is not too much to ask. It's not any different from the fact that uh, you want to vote, you're going to have to fill out in most states, except for a small number, a voter registration form, submit it to get registered, and provide a certain amount of information to the state to do that. It, it's the, the, the courts have said that is not a burden to voters. But you may disagree, but the courts disagree with that. But if, if my voter ID has my ID has expired, and I didn't realize it, even though I'm a registered, registered voter, I don't get the vote. Uh, that's not true. In many states, you'll be able to, they'll give you a provisional ballot, and then you have a certain amount of time, I think in Indiana it's like 10, maybe 10 days, uh, to go to the election officials and show them a photo ID so you can go and you can get renewed. That's your mistake. That's not the state's problem. Well, I think what, what the response uh, could be to that is that if there isn't a demonstrated problem of impersonation fraud that puts one in peril of five years of prison time, then putting those impediments in front of people, even if it doesn't affect more than 10,000 people in a million, uh, is it justified? Is it a burden? There's been now, we know what the courts think, we know what they believe. So, I mean, we can talk about constitutional burdens, we can talk about what's the right thing to do. I think the right thing to do is to make it easier for my dad to vote. I think it's that simple. You don't need to put an impediment in front of him so that he has to go through the, the really traumatic experience of trying to go and get his ID updated when he hasn't needed it for five years. Uh, it is an impediment. Is it justified? And I think the evidence is just lacking for that. Yes, in back. This is regarding elderly people with or without IDs. An elderly individual, and I'm assuming we're talking about somebody who's 65 or older, would be eligible for Medicare and would have a Medicare card. It's not a photo ID, but it is a government-issued ID. Would that form of ID then, if they, had, if they lacked a birth certificate or these mm -hmm. other forms of mm -hmm. things, wouldn't that then be a piece of ID that they could use to obtain a photo ID, a government-issued photo ID? I think it depends on the state. I mean, I don't, I don't know the... It, it depends on the state. And, for example, you know, this constant talk that people who are poor aren't going to be able to do it. Well, if they want to apply for Medicaid or food stamps, they're going to have to have a government-issued photo ID. You can look at the rules for that. The states in South Carolina, I actually I blogged about this, um, uh, the fact that in South Carolina, you look at the state website for that, and they talk about the federal requirements they have to put in place. And I just have to say, I... I you know, every time I hear people say, well, we don't need to worry about this because, you know, voter fraud is a felony and people aren't going to commit this crime. Uh, because of that, I guess that means that the Iowa legislature 
uh, can zero out all budgeting for prisons in the state because obviously your prisons are empty because people are so fearful of the punishment, so they're obviously not committing any crimes here. I, well, I, I would argue that, uh, Hans, that when you commit a crime, at least a, a kind of premeditated crime, you're doing an analysis of whether or not the risk is worth the benefit. And show me the person who's willing to risk going to prison for five years to give their favorite politician one puny little vote. Find that person for me, Hans. I'd love to talk to uh, you. The, I, I suggest you go to the website of the Republican National Lawyers Association. They've put up a map and a survey of voter fraud convictions around the country uh, in, I think, 48 states over the last 10 years. Uh, Google the current the current uh, uh, trial, as I said, going on in Troy, New York, where one of the people who pleaded guilty said to the police, this is the accepted way of doing elections here. We've been doing it for years. And there are cases of this all the time. The place this happens the most is in small, poor counties like Greene County. Why? Because in Greene County, the source of jobs, the source of money, was local government. And it was worth stealing votes to win. I mean, they just announced a prosecution in West Virginia, I think a week ago, the Justice Department did. Again, people were willing to risk it because as a longtime uh, Justice Department prosecutor told me, this was the guy at the Justice Department who had been uh, prosecuting election crimes for 30 years, um, if you can win an election, it means money, it means control of local government, and there are people who are willing to do that. And back there? And I think this will be the last question. Is that, is that all right? I'll try and make it a good one. Uh, at, I'll finish strong. At, <laughs> unless we filibuster. Right? Okay. <laughs> uh, the, the conversation kind of overtook my question but from when I raised my hand. But as a prosecutor, I, I, would, I have a question for you about ordinary voter fraud. Um, and let me give you an anecdote. In the June 2010 primary in, in Muscatine County, the election occurs, and then the next week the auditor comes over to the county attorney's office, ashen-faced with two lists, and says, you know, a felon voted in the primary, what should we do? You'll be glad to know we'll take partisanship out of it. Uh, the felon voted in the Republican primary, and so presumably voted for me. Uh, <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> you can put uh, that in your brochure. Yeah, I, but here's the problem. Criminals. Without a photo ID, all you have is a name on a list of felons and a name on a list of people who voted. And it's, so you, know, you call the sheriff to go investigate and basically tell them, go find the person, and if he confesses, arrest him. If he doesn't confess, leave. And, and the point is, those cases are really hard to prosecute. Because the election worker is not going to be able to say, this person out of 800 people who came through a polling place, I can remember when he came in and got a ballot. They, have, they, they cannot reliably tell you who came in and came out. All they know is who got checked off on a list. And if you don't have some sort of system of producing a, a photo ID, you don't have really any way, absent the fool talking to the police, to prosecute that case. And so. It, it may be that the lack of voter fraud prosecutions in the state of Iowa is not an example of a lack of voter fraud. It means they're really hard to prove. Now, that, that's exactly right. And in fact, the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals, when it upheld um, the district court's finding that Indiana's law was constitutional, specifically talked about the fact that how in the world are you going to detect this kind of fraud if you don't have the tool of voter ID to do it? And another great example of this, and uh, I know Ben says uh, we shouldn't go by anecdote, but uh, you, can, you can Google this and you can find the, um, the newspaper coverage of this. Uh, in Hoboken, New York in 2007, uh, the local zoning board president was on his way to his polling place. He noticed a group of men on the side of the road being in a circle being handed index cards by these other two gentlemen. He noticed one of the guys, because it looked kind of like somebody he knew, it wasn't though, he went to his polling place as an observer. A little while later, the person he'd seen on the side came into the polling place and tried to vote in the name of one of the voters. Well, this guy knew that this guy wasn't the voter. The election official didn't know it. 
They don't have an ID requirement in New Jersey. He challenged the man's right to vote. The man ran out of the polling place, and the zoning board guy ran after him, on, calling on his cell phone, called the police. They arrested him. The guy admitted that he was uh, from a homeless shelter and that he and the other gentleman had been each given an index card with the name of a voter to go in and vote in, and they'd been paid $10 to do it. The point is that this would never have been caught if this guy hadn't seen him. And the exact same thing happened, as you all know, in New Hampshire a couple of weeks ago in the GOP primary. James O'Keefe of Acorn fame, you know, sent uh, people with undercover cameras into the polling places there. They had checked local obituaries for a couple of weeks before the election. They found the names of people who were dead, who were still on the registration list. He sent people in. In every case, they got a ballot handed to them because New Hampshire has no photo ID law, except for one precinct. Okay, good. Was... And in that one precinct, that it was... in that one precinct, the only reason that mm -hmm. the, the undercover person didn't get the ballot in the name of the dead person was because the election official, just by coincidence, actually knew the person who was dead. Mm -hmm. Okay, and that's why New Hampshire now is actually thinking seriously about passing a voter ID law. Uh, local DAs also have. I'm, I'm glad to hear you're interested in this, but most local DAs are extremely reluctant to uh, pull the, uh, go after these cases because they have you know, murder cases and rape cases, and this doesn't seem like a big priority when they do it. And they also have a big problem. Most DAs are elected, and when they do voter fraud prosecutions, they're almost sure to make half the electorate mad, depending on whether they're prosecuting a Democrat or a Republican. Why don't we give Mr. Scott yeah, I, a few I, minutes? Well, I do think that, uh, you know, clearly in a country as big as this, uh, with as many voters as we have in this country, even if a lot of them don't exercise their right to vote, um, there's, you know, there's problems. There's, there's plenty of problems out there. I mean, there, there are voting rolls that are inaccurate, that are outdated, uh, poor addresses. But, uh, you know, if, if that role that you mentioned in, uh, in was that New Jersey? New Jersey. Or New York or whatever. You know, if the, if, the, if the list was accurate, then there would have been no names to write on index cards to give to some poor slob to come in and, and vote illegally. And, if you, and, you know, I always kind of wonder about this. What if you just had uh, a sign in every voting place that said uh, impersonating another person in order to vote is a crime punishable by five years in a federal prison if it's a federal election? Uh, I mean, there are ways that you can deal with these issues. And, again, we just need to... Uh, recognize that if you have a voter ID requirement, it will suppress some of the vote. We can speculate on how much, but it will suppress some. And is, it, is that justified by the benefit? And are there other avenues that are available to the government to solve some of these problems that do not create an impediment to someone's uh, very precious right to vote? Let's give a hand to both of these panelists. Thank you. Us. Thank you again uh, to our, our panel and our moderator and for all of you uh, for coming out. This is you know, precisely the sort of uh, e event that the Federalist Society, our chapter here, was founded to try to uh, establish and have thoughtful civil discussions and uh, excited to have have uh, participated in that today and I encourage you uh, if, if you have ideas of future events that you're interested in and uh, issues that you think would be good for us to be participating in uh, don't hesitate to contact me or any of the other uh, members of the steering committee of the Federalist Society we uh, welcome those ideas and look forward to seeing you all again uh, soon in the future so have a good night <laughs>